Thank you for joining. My name is Dion Rossiter, and I am the executive director of a program called Science at Cal, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But welcome to our Midday Science Cafe for the month, leveraging the quantum realm, featuring two of our esteemed scientists at both UC Berkeley and Berkeley Labs, Dr. Sarah Moradian and Kasra Noruzi. So thank you for being here. We're excited to have you here, and we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to remind you to save the date for our next Midday Science Cafe in April on the 15th. And we want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, we recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you for allowing me to take the time to do that. Again, as I said, I run a program called Science at Cal at UC Berkeley. We celebrate science through public programming, um, traditionally live, so we hope to see you again soon. But uh, for you know the last year, we have been virtual like most things, so it's so exciting to see more people here than we normally would because our programs are open to all. We host science cafes, lectures, festivals, and more. You can find out more about our programming on the web. You can join our listserv if you haven't yet. I hope you all have. Um, and we are also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all at Science at Cal. Before I hand things over to Jen, I just want to remind everyone to uh, add all of your questions throughout the entire presentation in either the chat or the Q&A, um, because we will be asking our scientists each questions at the end of their presentations. And then at the end, we'll come all together and have a Q&A with all of us together. And hopefully we'll get to everyone's questions, um, all the questions that were submitted in advance and all the questions coming through. So we can't wait to hear from you. This uh, program will, it is being recorded and we will share it with all of you after the event. So now I'd like to invite Jen Tang up to give a little bit more about this collaboration between Berkeley Lab and Science at Cal and explain more about what Berkeley Lab does and who they are. So take it away, Jen. Thanks so much, Dee. Hi, folks. My name is Jen Tang, and I'm the Director for Federal and Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And as some of you might know, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national research laboratories across the country. And we are supported by the Department of Energy's Office of Science and managed by the University of California. And all of the research we conduct at the lab is unclassified. Since our founding back in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, the lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the most intractable problems faced by humankind. And for those doing the math, this year is the lab's 90th anniversary. And as we celebrate our past achievements and imagine what discoveries the next 90 years might bring, we hope you'll visit our 90th anniversary webpage, which is berkeleylabnextin90.lbl.gov, where you'll find many features and opportunities to engage with us, including an upcoming lecture on Friday, April 30th about game-changing solutions to the fight against climate change. Now today, Berkeley Lab researchers work on developing sustainable energy and environmental solutions. We create new useful materials. We advance the frontiers of computing, which you'll hear a little bit later about today. And we probe the mysteries of life, matter, and the universe. Our main campus is nestled in the Berkeley Hills above the UC Berkeley campus. And we employ about 4,000 people, about 1,700 of whom are scientists and engineers. And more than 500 of our employees are undergraduates and graduate students. And these are scientists who are just beginning their research journey. 
Now, the lab's close proximity to Cal and the UC system have created a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. And a number of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as students, postdocs, or faculty who have joined appointments at the lab. And as you can imagine, our relationship with UC Berkeley is especially close and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across many frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating the Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary research from both of our institutions. We hope you enjoy today's presentation on quantum information science. Thanks so much and Dee, back to you. Thank you, Jen. I am going to stop share and I am going to invite our first speaker. Again, this is Dr. Sarah Moradian and she is a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, um, working in engineering quantum systems. She's particularly interested in the technologies which will allow us to increase the size and complexity of these systems. Sarah studied at MIT in Boston before moving to the Bay Area. In her spare time, she enjoys cooking and exploring um, all of the beauty that California has to offer. So thank you, Sarah. We can't wait to hear your talk. So take it away. Great. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the invitation to come speak here. Uh, so I'd like to begin today answering a simple question, which is what is quantum mechanics? And so quantum mechanics is the, are the laws that describe what happens at the atomic scale. So here we have a picture of a, a, you know, a molecule, how these atoms bond together, you know, what energy, uh, different energy configurations this molecule can have, how this molecule interacts with other molecules, et cetera. So that can help us answer uh, questions about how these molecules behave. So for instance, water, you know, why does water freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit? Why does it boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit? You know, uh, that is governed, those temperatures are governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. And this particular question might seem a little boring. You know, if we wanted to know when water boiled, we can just heat it up and measure that temperature. But there are other questions that are harder to answer um, experimentally. So for instance, a more complicated molecule is uh, here, this coronavirus, which we all know well, far too well. So there, uh, as you may know, it, it, this virus uh, attaches to cells with these little, uh, these proteins on the outside, these spike proteins. So if we were able to simulate uh, th these proteins with you know, perhaps a quantum mechanical simulator, we could be able to answer the question more quickly, why is this coronavirus so infectious? And we could also perhaps design new drugs to uh, attach to these, uh, um, binding mechanisms, or perhaps, you know, remove these binding mechanisms to find ways to stop this virus. So uh, this, of course, was first, uh, um, you know, understood by Richard Feynman, who has this quote, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. So those are the two things I'd like to talk about today is first, how do we engineer a useful quantum system? What properties do we use and what makes it so difficult? Why have we not been able to make a quantum computer yet? So first I'd like to explain a little bit about quantum information. So first, first let's talk about classical information. So we can uh, you know, store information in many different uh, things. For instance, this on and off light switch uh, this is, you know, very similar to the zero and one transistors that make up our classical computers. And, you know, this is a very simple system. And if we have two friends both looking at this light switch, no matter how we look at, at it, it's always going to read off or zero. The quantum world is a little bit more complicated. So instead of just having an on or off state, we describe the, a quantum state by some point along a sphere. So we already see that the quantum world can hold more complexity than the classical world. But that's not the end of the story. So if I prepare this quantum bit in a state that looks a lot like this classical off state, so just you know, purely down in this circle, if I uh, look at it in the same basis that I prepared it in, we see that it looks off. 
But if I ask my friend who's looking at it from a different angle, you know, with a different measurement device, she's going to be confused. She's going to see half the time she'll see it be on and half the time that it'll be off. And this is an important and, you know, strange, if we're looking at it from the view of classical mechanics results, shows that quantum results of a measurement depend on how you do the measurement. So that is one thing that we use, you know, this complexity and this strange measurement uh, idea to uh, create complex quantum systems. The second thing is quantum entanglement. So, uh, you know, now we want to encode a lot of information. If we have classical information, we can encode this information in a classical book. And in a classical book, we get this information from reading individual pages. You know, as you turn the pages of your book, you get more and more information that the storyteller is trying to tell you. If we had a quantum book, it would look quite different. And if we opened it to any page, we, it would just look like gibberish. You know, they turn the page and it looks just like gibberish again. We gain no information by looking at an individual page or, in, you know, a more precise terms, we don't get any information by, we get very little information by looking at the state of an individual qubit. Instead, the information is stored in the correlations or the entanglement between pages. And I just like to mention here that I borrowed this analogy from John Preskill, and of course he does an incredible job explaining this. And if you're uh, interested in uh, you know, what makes quantum mechanics so exciting, you can look up this YouTube video. So that is why quantum is so strange or so different from the classical world. And so um, I'd like to now set out a timeline of where we have uh, come from and where we're going in building up quantum technologies. So the theory behind quantum mechanics was kind of developed in the 1920s. Um, and then by the 1960s, we knew enough about quantum mechanics to leverage that understanding, to use materials that we find around, the, uh, you know, around us in the world uh, you know, to their full potential. So for instance, quantum mechanics underpins what makes lasers so powerful, as well as MRI machines. And then in the 1990s, two things happened kind of simultaneously. So, you know, this was after Richard, Richard Feynman uh, understood that quantum mechanics could be used for simulation or, you know, would be necessary for quantum simulation. Um, it's so we uh, scientists, uh, theorists started coming up with the first quantum computing algorithms that looked a little bit like classical computing algorithms in which you have some input you do some operations on that input and you get an output that encodes the answer that you were looking for. And at nearly the same time, somewhat coincidentally, experimentalists starting, started to gain experimental control over small quantum systems. So in this picture here, we have Dave Weinland and some of his colleagues standing in front of one of the first trapped ion experiments. Uh, and this experiment was what won them the Nobel Prize uh, for control of a single quantum system. And since then, for the last 30 years at this point, we've been trying to increase the size and the complexity of the quantum systems that we can control. So you, one might ask, it's been 30 years, you know, we've known about this for quite a long time, why haven't we been able to do it yet? And that's because, uh, you know, with all the upsides, quantum mechanics also has some downsides. So the, and the, the next three things that I'm going to talk about, I'd like you to keep in mind every time you listen to uh, talks or read things about quantum mechanics in, in the future. The first is coherence time. So a classical bit, you know, if you switch a light switch on, it's going to stay on basically forever. That's not true for a quantum bit. Because the quantum mechanic, uh, a quantum bit is a, you know, a fundamentally quantum thing, any interaction with the big classical noisy environment around it is going to change its slight state slightly. And so if we look at the state over time, we're going to see that it decays, uh, you know, slowly into um, to having no information at all, you know, being right around 0 0.5, where it doesn't encode any information. And this is what we call the coherence time. And so I just like to make this point that quantum states lose their information due to interactions, unwanted interactions and uncontrollable interactions with the classical world. The second thing that you have to keep in mind is the operation fidelity. Again, in, in, in classical mechanics and you know, in classical computing, we can turn on and off light switches. We can you know, change the state from a zero to one of a classical bit over and over again, and we can do it with perfect fidelity. 
quantum operations, on the other hand, aren't always as precise. So, you know, this graph here is a little bit exaggerated, but it shows that every time we try to switch the state, go from off to on, for instance, we undershoot by just a little bit. So we have a little bit of error and those errors compound over time. The third thing you have to make, uh, you know, you have to keep in mind is the operation time. So here I've shown this coherence time. And the point is that you need to be able to do many, many, many operations within the coherence time. So of course we want our quantum computer to be fast, just like you want your classical computer to be fast. So we want a, a, a very fast clock speed, but it's even more important for quantum systems because of this decoherence. So you can see that you can do many more operations if you can do them fast. Um, so there are many platforms that people are looking into to build these quantum systems. So for instance, superconducting systems, our next speaker is going to talk about that. And there are many, you know, both companies and academic groups working towards that. You can actually also use light. You can use individual photons or photonic states uh, to uh, carry quantum information and do quantum computations. And again, there are both companies, Cyquantum here in the South Bay and Xanadu in, in uh, Canada, as well as academic groups working on that. And then the last kind of section is atomic like systems. So, you know, you can use single atoms. You can use single atomic like structures trapped in solid state. So, for instance, during my PhD, I worked on defects in diamond and actually, uh, you know, using the quantum properties of those defects to work towards quantum information processing. And then finally, you can use ions. So, uh, and this is what I uh, work on uh, in my research now. So all of these have different pluses and minuses. Superconducting qubits are incredibly fast. They're also fairly easy to make. They, uh, you know, they utilize long-standing semiconductor fabrication. Light is very useful because it's very coherent, but it's kind of hard to get uh, light to interact with itself. Single atoms can be very high fidelity. These solid state qubits are really easy to work with. If I give you a chunk of diamond, you can probably see some quantum effects fairly easily, uh, but they end up being not very coherent. And of course I like ions best because I'm, you know, I work on ions and I would say that they're both coherent and they allow you to get really high fidelity operations. So I'd like to, you know, really briefly talk about, uh, you know, how, what calcium ions are, what ions are and how we use them for quantum information processing. So in our lab uh, at, at UC Berkeley, we use calcium ions. So we start with a, a calcium atom. We remove one electron. So we have this ionized, positively charged ionized calcium. And then because it's positively charged, we can trap the ions with electric fields and we can detect them with lasers. And so you see here, this is a very complicated trap built at Sandia National Labs that allows us to trap long strings of ions. So every, every single dot that you see here is an individual ion and it's fluorescing blue because that's the transition that we use to detect. Um, and then for our quantum information, we encode the quantum information in different states of the you know, electronic structure. And maybe you remember from your chemistry classes that there are these different orbitals. So we use you know, the, the coherence between these different orbitals to uh, encode our quantum information. And we, do, we make changes, we go from zero to one into this quantum uh, bit using again, a laser. So we, we change and control this ion state with a laser. And then, so if we, you know, I told you to always ask three questions about any quantum system. First, the coherence time is incredibly long. Um, you can get, uh, it's fairly easy to get, you know, milliseconds of coherence time and people have shown up to hours of coherence time. Oper operation fidelity is quite high. We can get error rates less than one in a thousand. And the operation time is between one and 10 microseconds. Um, and so with that, I'd like to conclude, and I hope that you've gotten three things out of this talk. One, that engineered quantum systems can help us simulate natural systems. Researchers in this field are currently working to increase coherence time, decrease errors, and decrease operation time. And third, of course, that ions are great. Uh, and with that, I will uh, conclude. Lovely. Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. So I do have a question about something you said in, in your presentation. You said that it's hard for light to interact with itself. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, so light um, is, uh, you can kind of think, um, 
you know, when you throw two balls at each other, or if you throw a ball at your brother, for instance, it'll like hit him and reflect back at you and, you know, hurt him, hopefully not very much. But if you take light, if you take a flashlight and point it at your brother, that's not going to hurt him. And that's because light doesn't interact very well with things surrounding it which is good because it means that it's very coherent. It doesn't lose its state very easily, but it's bad because it's, it means it's hard to change its state. Or maybe actually in quantum computing, the more apt description is you take two flashlights or two lasers and point them across each other. They're just gonna go straight through each other as if nothing happened, but that won't happen if you throw two balls at each other. Got it. So I hope that that was clear for our audience member. Um, let me know if you have more questions about that. So how about this question? Um, what are the biggest techno uh, technological challenges as it relates to your the trapped ions uh, work that you do? Yeah. So um, I said a few times about lasers. So we detect uh, ions with lasers, we control ions with lasers, and actually we need even more lasers. You know, I kind of put two here, but in the end we need almost four per ion. Um, and, you know, one, we need those re really good lasers, high power, very stable lasers, that's difficult. And also we have to route that light to each of our ions individually. Um, so, you know, laser sources and laser routing, I think are the two biggest challenges. Excellent. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Jen and Kasra, um, and we can get to the rest of the questions when we come all together. We still have an opportunity to speak with Sarah a little later, so stay tuned for that, and I will hand things over to Jen. Again, Sarah, amazing. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. And now it's my pleasure to invite our next speaker to the screen, Dr. Kasra Naruzi, who's the quantum hardware lead at the Advanced Quantum Testbed at Berkeley Lab. Kasra is a part of a multidisciplinary team engaged in research and development to build and use full stack experimental platforms for superconducting quantum computing experiments. And prior to joining the Advanced Quantum Testbed, Kasra researched phase retrieval X-ray microscopy at the lab's advanced light source where he built a world-leading X-ray microscope that's used to study the properties of materials in action at the nanoscale, for example, observing the flow of lithium ions in a battery. In his spare time, Casper likes to practice karate, be careful he's got a black belt, and go hiking in the beautiful and gorgeous East Bay Hills. All right, Casper, over to you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. And thank you, Sarah, for uh, introducing uh, the audience to the fundamentals of what goes into building a, a, a functioning quantum computer uh, and the principles behind uh, uh, its power. Uh, so I would like to take this uh, in the direction of a different uh, way of implementing quantum computing. Uh, as uh, Sarah mentioned, there are different uh, platforms that are being developed right now. Uh, five such platforms are listed here again. You have dopants in silicon and diamond. You have trapped ions, which Sarah researches and talked about. Uh, we have photonic circuits, uh, topological wires, and then finally superconducting circuits. Um, so they all have uh, their own points of uh, strength and weakness. There's good reason to pursue each uh, direction. Uh, but uh, as of now, uh, here I have um, a list of these five and some figures of merit. Uh, as of now, the, the two uh, platforms that are in the lead in terms of maturity and figures of merit are superconducting platforms and trapped ions. Um, so uh, what Sarah talked about, qubit lifetimes, which, is, which determines how long you have to finish your computation before your quantum system decoheres, essentially dies. Um, then you have the gate fidelity, which is the accuracy with which you can do the, the operations. Uh, gate operation time, this is how fast you can run the operations. And connectivity, which, is, uh, which determines how many uh, qubits you can entangle, you can tie together, uh, which is a part of the source of, of the power of your system. Um, and this slide is from Boston Consulting Group. It is a year or two old. Uh, right now, we're, we're even better than this. Uh, we, we can do uh, gate operations faster. We have longer lifetimes. And, and these two together determine uh, how many operations you can do to, before your system dies. Um, uh, when you put it all together, uh, these, uh, these are determined, these, these are at the leading edge. 
And actually the superconducted platform is the one where uh, quantum supremacy has been demonstrated uh, about a year and a half ago by, by Google, uh, which is where you have uh, a quantum system, a quantum computer uh, perform an, a, a task, solve a problem uh, much, much faster than even the fastest classical supercomputer can, uh, can do it. Um, now that was uh, the example that was used there was more of a contrived example, uh, not simulating a physical system or something like that, a, a molecule or something like that, but it still shows uh, that we are really hitting our milestones and, and we're progressing fast. Um, and uh, the era that we're in now is called the NISC era, the noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum computing um, era. Uh, and this is where we will be for the next five or 10 years uh, uh, as we advance to a state where we can uh, solve the, the problems with noise and with crosstalk, with, with uh, all, all sorts of mechanisms for errors that limit our, uh, our, our, our uh, uh, operations today. And as we extend the lifetime of our systems. So uh, at, uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we have uh, developed, uh, uh, we have basically built a, a program uh, that brings together researchers from uh, multiple divisions at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, but also from UC Berkeley, the MIT Lincoln Lab, which is another uh, national laboratory, uh, and also a company by the name of Bleximo, uh, who are experts as, at cryogenic engineering. Um, and uh, we've brought all these people together from multiple disciplines and backgrounds to uh, build uh, really end-to-end -end, uh, platforms uh, to do quantum computation. So here you see some of the elements that go into that. Uh, first, you have uh, this uh, dilution fridge, which is the picture probably that uh, you're familiar with, you've seen in news releases and such. Um, and uh, this is basically the, the platform that cools down uh, the quantum chip uh, to near absolute zero temperature, much colder than outer space even. Uh, then you have the cryo packaging that uh, houses your quantum chip uh, and uh, integrates it into the, the fridge. Uh, then there are multiple uh, kinds of in control instrument stacks that generate and, uh, pulses that you need to control the, the quantum device. Uh, and then of course you have the quantum chip uh, and, and a lot of architecture and engineering goes into that. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you need really multidisciplinary people from, from all backgrounds to work together to make all of this happen. Uh, so this is what we've done at the advanced quantum test bed. Um, and uh, we now have uh, really fully functioning uh, quantum computers there and we're uh, investigating uh, both solving uh, problems, uh, using it to solve problems, but also uh, using the platform to advance the state of quantum computing itself. Uh, so, uh, but it all really starts uh, with the qubit, the quantum bit, which is the, the fundamental unit of, of your, your, your quantum information processing. Uh, so we, and, and we need a system that has different levels of energy. As Sarah explained in, in trapped ions, uh, the ion itself, the atom, you know, the different electron orbitals, that's the natural mechanism to do it. So we need a way to create an artificial system that acts like an atom, uh, which means it has discrete energy levels that, that, that are accessible to us. Uh, something like this. You can, you can select the, the lowest energy level to be your zero state and uh, the next level up to be your one state. Uh, so uh, a way to engineer this uh, and this is going to be the, you know, my one slide that has some technical uh, notation on it, but don't worry if, if, uh, if uh, you're not familiar with it. Uh, if you've, you have taken uh, some introductory physics course, you might know that if you put a capacitor and an inductor in parallel, you, have, you get some sort of an oscillatory behavior that acts kind of like an, a pendulum. Um, and it, if you cool it down enough and make it really quantum mechanical, you get these uh, discrete energy states. Now, the problem is that uh, this is a linear system, so you, you don't you, you get zero and one, but you get multiple levels above that. So if you send in uh, microwave pulses, if you send in the photons to to uh, transition between these levels, you have no control over which level is, it goes to. It's all the same. You can you can drive the system uh, up and down indefinitely, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, so you need a way to make it nonlinear so that the energy levels between uh, between these are different. And so to to do this. Uh, we take advantage of uh, uh, an element called the Josephson junction, 
Um, and that replaces our classical inductor. Uh, so the Josephson junction is a nonlinear element that is basically, uh, uh, it takes advantage of an insulator that is sandwiched between two layers of superconductors. And a, a superconductor, you can just think of it as, as something that allows some form of a current to flow without resistance. Um, and this acts kind of like a nonlinear uh, inductive element. Uh, and it gives you these different energy levels that, that, that are not, not the same uh, amount apart. Uh, you actually get put two of these in parallel, but, but that doesn't matter. This is a picture of uh, uh, an example of this fabricated in our labs. Uh, it is in size, it's really smaller than, than the thickness of, of, of a human hair. Uh, and a lot really goes into engineering this element and making it really uh, uh, high quality so that uh, you don't lose your information uh, to the environment. Uh, and then this needs to be cooled down uh, to near uh, absolute zero to sit in its ground state so that just the thermal energy from the environment doesn't excite it to occupy higher states because that's what you need. When you're not doing computation with your system, when you're not intentionally driving it, you want it to be at the zero state. And this is an example of the kind of uh, engineering and characterization uh, that goes into bu building these devices. Unfortunately, at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, we have all sorts of uh, teams at different divisions who uh, both engineer these and uh, cut these, put them under electron microscopes and such to, uh, to look at their properties uh, so that we can iterate and improve upon them to make these higher quality elements. So once you have this uh, transmon qubit, uh, then you need to build a quantum processor out of it. So uh, much like in your classical computer, you have a CPU. Uh, in, a, in a quantum computer, you have a QPU, the, the quantum processing unit. And this is an example of what it might look like. Uh, so the green elements there uh, in, in the picture, those are the transmons. Uh, then uh, the you you drive these transmons with those through those blue lines. Uh, so those are basically microwave dr drive lines uh, where you you send in microwave photons around five gigahertz or so um, you know, to 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 drive them bet between zero and one and any any state in between. Um, then you need a way to entangle these and uh, have them basically feel each other. And uh, that's what the resonators in between the, the purple elements, that's, that's the pur pur purpose that they serve. You can kind of think of this together, the transmon as being a pendulum and the uh, resonator there in between as kind of a spring. Uh, so if, if one pendulum is, 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 is swinging, the other pendulum feels it uh, through that spring in between. Um, and then uh, at the end of your computation, you want to be able to read out the state of the, you know, of the transmon. And for that, you have those red elements, which are again, kind of spring-like elements, resonators. And they couple to uh, the light blue line, uh, which is the, the readout line. And, and you can read, read out multiple of these at the same time. Um, so this is an example. Uh, this, this is not the, uh, the only way you can do this. There are multiple ways and we, we are, uh, we have been working on developing all sorts of fancier uh, quantum processing units, but this will kind of give you a sense of what a quantum computing chip looks like. Uh, and as, as you see, uh, many decades of uh, lithographic developments in Silicon Valley and other places has really gone into uh, building something like this. We're really taking advantage uh, and standing on the shoulder of giants uh, who have developed uh, all of this previously for classical computing and, and, and classical electronics. So once you have this chip, you need to cool it down to near absolute zero, and you need to provide a way to protect your qubits from the environment, uh, because if you don't do that, then uh, the coherence time will be shortened. So basically your system dies much more quickly. And this is kind of a, one of the paradoxical puzzles at the, at the core of quantum computing is uh, you need to be able to control your qubit. So you need to have a path to the outside world, but at the same time, you want to be able to fully protect it from any other unwanted interaction. And doing both at the same time is a very difficult task. And so uh, that, is, that is basically the, the, the engineering challenge that goes into building the rest of the system. So you take this quantum processing unit, uh, then you wire bond it inside some, some cryo packaging, which means a, a, a box essentially that has connectors to the outside world. Um, and then you put this under 
uh, this, uh, at, at the very bottom of this dilution refrigerator, uh, which is cooled to about 10 millikelvin in Fahrenheit, is, um, it's noted there, negative 459.65 Fahrenheit. And, uh, and as you see, there are multiple wires here that, that basically take you from uh, above the fridge room temperature all the way down to below where your, where your box sits. And the task of these, so I have, I have a schematic here. We don't really need to understand uh, what all of those little boxes and, and uh, figures here mean. Uh, the point here is that uh, this is actually kind of a simple version of what goes into uh, solving that puzzle of keeping the qubits protected uh, yet providing access to the outside world to, to send in signals and, and take out signals. Um, and here on the left, I have a picture of what happens below uh, all of the, the cryoengineering that, that goes into uh, building uh, a pathway between the signals coming in and then uh, communicating with, the, with your quantum processor here at the very bottom. Um, so to point again to the hierarchy of where we're standing, uh, you, you need all sorts of digital electronics outside of your fridge. Then you have uh, analog pathways going into the fridge. And it's really at the very bottom is where the quantum stuff happens and the quantum processing and quantum signals. Uh, and uh, this you know, uh, points out the, the complexity. This is not something that would have been doable a few decades ago, right? Because uh, the last century really has seen the development of electronics in, in the classical sense, both digital and analog. Um, and that is why we are now able to, to build the quantum uh, elements at, at the very bottom. Uh, so we are really taking advantage of what has come before us. So finally, you have your, your quantum computer. Uh, you have everything that is needed to, uh, to do your computation. What can you do with it? So as Sarah mentioned, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, decades ago in the 80s, uh, proposed this uh, scheme of computation mainly to simulate how nature works. This is really comp computing as nature intended, right? Um, this is well suited to, uh, to solve uh, problems and help us understand how atoms come together to form molecules to, to perform to, to have different properties. So we're not there yet where we can simulate really complicated uh, molecules to build, you know, uh, develop new drugs or build new materials that, that serve particular purposes. Uh, but what we can do now is really start moving in that direction. Uh, so what I'm showing here um, is an example of this that was done in collaboration between uh, Berkeley Lab and UC Berkeley about three or four years ago. Uh, this is a simulation of the hy hydrogen molecule. Um, and so basically what you're seeing, is, so the question is, the hydrogen molecule is made of two hydrogen atoms. And uh, the configuration there, you have really one degree of freedom. You have one parameter that you need to solve for, and that is what is the distance uh, between uh, the, the atoms to make the molecule be stable and stay in place as, as a molecule instead of the two atoms going different directions and fall apart. And uh, you see the different energy states as simulated on a, a quantum computer, uh, on our quantum computer. The dots here are basically points that we solve for, and, and the lines are theory, uh, uh, predicted theory. And uh, you see the blue line, the, the blue uh, shows the lowest state, the ground state of the hydrogen molecule. And uh, at the lowest level, this is the, the point of lowest potential energy, which is where the system is stable. Uh, this is where you get the hydrogen molecule. And uh, so you know, that's uh, basically, that's about half an angstrom. Um, and uh, it agrees perfectly with, with what you would expect. So we've shown that the problem that for, the problem for which quantum computing was proposed can be solved. We have solved it and we are uh, going in the direction of uh, applying this to larger and much more complicated molecules. Uh, and the hope is that in a few years, we will be able to simulate uh, much more complicated molecules to develop new drugs and build new materials. Uh, but really where we are now, after so many decades, uh, it's a kind of a useful analogy. It's not a perfect analogy. Uh, it's, it's a, some things are, are a bit different now, but if you think of classical computing, uh, the way it was developed, 
uh, in the 1940s, we had functioning uh, computers uh, that used vacuum tubes, these really large elements. Uh, and you had IBM building rooms full of uh, these vacuum tubes and wiring them together to build uh, computers uh, that worked. Uh, then uh, in the 1950s, uh, the transistor was developed at Bell Labs. And uh, many of these were put together and built in a different way. And how, that's how you got integrated circuits. And then finally, microprocessors in the 1970s and going forward. And that's how you have your uh, computers now. This is really uh, what it took to get here. And you can really argue that uh, as far as this analogy goes, we're really in that vacuum tube stage, right? We have finally demonstrated after many decades that we have functioning quantum computers. Um, and uh, where we go from here uh, is, is an open question. And it's, it takes really all of the might of uh, the best scientists in the world to work together, uh, pursue different paths and try all sorts of different ideas uh, to finally get us to a place where quantum computers can uh, reach their full potential. Uh, but the, the promise is there. It is well understood by everyone uh, and not just in academia and national labs, uh, but also in a uh, whole, whole host of uh, companies uh, in different industrial sectors. So I have a few of these again from uh, the Boston Consulting Group the, in the high tech, industrial goods, chemistry and pharma, finance and energy. Um, and this really goes beyond uh, just simulating physical systems now. I have some of the uh, some of the, the other applications on the left here, uh, you know, pattern detection, Fourier analysis, efficiently searching a large database, and so on. If if you know some of these might ring a bell with uh, more technically minded people, uh, but uh, it uh, it is understood now that there is huge potential in this, and uh, everybody is working together. Every you know companies have their own uh, groups pursuing quantum computing. Uh, and we're all working together, scientists across the fields, uh, different fields that feed into quantum computing uh, to solve this grand challenge. And uh, there are many different ways to do it, but uh, we're hopeful that uh, with persistence, we'll get there in, in a few years or decades. Uh, so uh, with that, I conclude my talk and thank you everyone for the attention. Thanks, Kasser, for that really interesting talk. Um, so we've got a couple questions for you before mm -hmm. we invite Sarah and Dee back to the screen. So let me ask this first. We got a couple of people wanting to know a little bit more about the dilution refrigerator. So could you talk a little bit more about what it does, why you need it, and if cooling is such an issue, what about putting the actual processing units you know, on the moon or in space? Right. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, the dilution refrigerator, so it, it, it has two tasks, really. Uh, and uh, the first task is uh, just, just cooling down to near absolute zero. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, so tying into that second question, why not in space or on the moon, uh, you know, forgetting the fact that it costs a lot and it's almost, you know, getting things up there is, is not that easy while providing easy access so that you can modify the system. Uh, even if you could do that, it would still not be cold enough. That's, that's the problem. Uh, so outside space, outer space, you know, just due to cosmic microwave background radiation from the Big Bang, from the, the, the origins of the universe, uh, outer space sits at above a Kelvin. And for this, we, we need something in the 10 millikelvin regime, so 100 times colder. Uh, and uh, this is what the dilution fridge uh, does. And it's engineered to do that through uh, basically the phase dynamics of different isotopes of helium. Um, and uh, so that's his first task. And the second task is uh, through all of the wiring and uh, the electrical components that I uh, schematically showed uh, is to provide a way to, uh, to give researchers sitting in room temperature access to the qubit so that they can run their operations on the qubit while shielding uh, the qubit from unwanted thermal noise you know all of the different sources of noise in the environment magnetic noise thermal noise all sorts of noises that would essentially decohere and destroy uh, the the quantum system uh, so that's the two, two two jobs that it does and it does does it pretty well at this point 
Got it. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, so we've got a bit of a technical question for you. What might be the lower limit on the time scale of quantum bit flipping? Uh, so, so this is about how fast you can run the operation, if I understand it correctly. Uh, since you're asking about the lower limit, meaning that you want to you want to know how fast we're going, uh, the challenge there. Uh, I don't know how technical I should get about this one, but uh, you can really, with the state of the room temperature control instruments that you have, it is possible to, to do it really fast. And um, with, I mean, this is part of the power of the superconducting systems, as opposed to trapped ions and other systems where uh, you will take much longer with, with uh, superconducting systems, you can go as fast as something like 10 nanoseconds, or these is actually even close to five nanoseconds. Um, the problem, and you can try to go faster than that. The problem is uh, when, when you shorten the time of these pulses, uh, in, in, in the frequency space, uh, you get more of a spread. Uh, and what that does is that it tends to then drive unwanted transitions so that you're not just going from zero to one, but from one to two, and it, it drives other transitions that you don't want. So if you want to really be able to get a pure signal that is uh, kind of sharp in the frequency domain so that you're really addressing the exact transition that you want, you have to make that trade off so that your pulse is a little bit longer. Uh, so nowadays it's about five nanoseconds, but uh, that is actually an active area of research, pulse shaping, uh, so that you can try to, uh, you can try to drive these systems faster and faster. Got it. Thanks so much, Kasra. Um, why don't we do this? Let us invite Sarah and Dee back to the screen. And we've got several more questions for both you and Sarah to answer from our audience. You know what? And I'm going to ask you, Kasra, to leave the, your screen up right here. Oh, yeah, <laughs> go back because there are many questions coming through. And I think that, so I'm going to read these both. Um, I'm going to read these to both of you and you can chime in. And I think that this um, this slide is really helpful for these questions because you talked about this, but maybe giving um, some actual examples. So the questions, there's been several that have sounded similar. So what are some examples of, and this is before you got to this slide, so I want to point that out, but um, what are some examples of the average man on the streets, why an average man on the streets would care whether or not we have quantum computers, mm -hmm. what kinds of things real world examples will quantum computers be able to do that classical computers cannot decrypt encryption keys and and reveal the content of encrypted data etc mm -hmm. um and then and so this is all sort of similar and then the last one what might um what might be the practical applications of the quantum realm to big problems i know that's even the title in our in our you know of you know, our, our description of what this is, what this talk is about, right, is how we're solving big problems, which I think you outline here. But if you guys want to give some man off the streets examples, things or woman off the streets, <laughs> please um, take some time to do that. Because a lot of people were asking similar questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know. Should, should I should I get started? Or Sarah, do you want to? Yeah, you can say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. So, I will start by saying that really the, I, I really want to, I know that I mentioned this, but I think it is worth emphasizing uh, that this really is how nature behaves, right? This is, you know, the model of computation that we have now, this is not just some, some other paradigm of computing that, that we physicists have co to, cooked up. This really is really computing as nature intended. And, and that is really what makes it uh, the perfect tool to simulate how nature itself behaves uh, how molecules are formed. And uh, that is our gateway into developing new molecules, into developing new uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, Sarah talked about uh, the coronavirus, for example. Uh, and and uh, that's not, you know, in a few years, we'll be in a place where the, the fastest, uh, most efficient supercomputers that we have nowadays won't be able to compete at all uh, with, with quantum computers. Um, and uh, that, that's what Richard Feynman kind of uh, had in mind when, when he talked about this uh, in the 80s. But what I would like to also then point out after this is that uh, it took more than 10 years after people had thought about this, this, this potential in the 80s uh, for other sorts of 
uh, applications to be brought up. In, in the 90s, for example, you, you mentioned cryptography. In the 90s, uh, Peter Shor talked about you know, Shor's, Shor's algorithm, which is factoring. So the way cryptography is done nowadays is, uh, is taking advantage of the fact that if you have two prime numbers, uh, you know, the prime number is the number that can't be factored into other numbers. If you have two prime numbers, it's very easy to multiply them. But if you take that multiplication, take that result, it's extremely difficult to break it down into its prime components, right? And uh, Peter Shor basically uh, pointed out that this can be done very easily using quantum computers. So there's a whole different class of complexity that is av made available to quantum computing, but it took more than 10 years for one example of that to come out. And uh, since then, uh, other examples have been coming out and, and other ways in which quantum computing will be useful. Uh, and I'm saying all of this to, to drive home the point that even new applications for quantum computing itself is an active area of research. We have theorists working today uh, about building, building the groundwork for, for the, the, the theory that goes into um, explaining uh, what you can do with quantum computing. Uh, but uh, it is, it is you know, some examples I have on the left here, for example, eff efficiently searching a large database that takes advantage of the fact that uh, you're in superposition, the, the, you know, in zero and one simultaneously, right? So that gives you the ability to search a wide uh, computational space simultaneously, statistically speaking, without having to go through it in a deterministic way, one by one. So uh, these are some, some of the elements that go into answering that question. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very much an active area of research. There will be, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, only ex we're only getting uh, stronger and stronger and coming up with new applications. And that's why it is, it is, uh, it is so active both in academia and, and uh, national labs, but also in all of these industrial companies, as you see on the right, everybody's working on this. Sorry for that long-winded uh, answer. No, I, hope, I hope the answer was somewhere in there. <laughs> I, 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 it definitely, it's in there. Um, I think if there was ever a, a case for funding basic research, there it is, right? The, the possibilities are endless. Discovering new and new technologies using quantum computing. I mean, I think that that's that. Um, Sarah, do you want to chime in? Do you have any specific examples or things that the, our, our audience might want to hear? Um, in addition think, to what Kasser said? Yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. I think it is an important thing to note that people are still, you know, pushing the frontiers of what quantum computing can give us. Um, and also to point out that, you know, as Kasser mentioned, you know, we're kind of in the 60s of quantum computing, you know, where we're, you know, with respect to classical computing in the 60s. And so back then we never could have imagined all the different applications. And I think as we build, you know, more and more complex quantum systems, they'll, it'll be easier for theorists to come up with new algorithms. You know, it'll be, and yeah, it, we'll get more and more applications as time goes on. What an exciting space to be. This is very cool. So as it relates to one of these potential um, areas where the, um, quantum computing might help, we have a question specifically asking, a lot has been written about how, how much energy is being consumed by the use of Bitcoin and blockchain. Mm -hmm. Would use of quantum computers potentially reduce the need for all of that energy? I heard a giggle. So this is for either of you, but... <laughs> I think yeah. that's a difficult question. Maybe Kester has a better answer, but you know, right now we're really at the infancy of quantum computing, um, and I wouldn't want to say either way of the energy requirements. You know, you know, there are certain problems for which, because quantum computing will give exponential speed ups, they will use less energy to solve the, to get to the same answer. Um, but I don't think that there is a for blockchain or Bitcoin in particular, I wouldn't want to make any strong statements. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. I, I will just expand on on the same answer. It's uh, there, you know, there are particular areas where quantum computing uh, will be astronomically faster 
than uh, classical computing because it's just it just operates on a different paradigm, you know. And when you think about those, in a few years when we correct the errors and we get closer to fault tolerant quantum computing, uh, for example, when you're simulating a molecule, uh, you know that is something that takes uh, weeks and months for even simple uh, molecules on classical supercomputers that we have now. And, and supercomputers are really uh, energy hungry, you know? And that, that kind of a task can be done in minutes on quantum computers in a few years. And so, yes, it will, that kind of thing will uh, end up saving us, not only open up a whole, whole new frontiers, but it will at the same time end up saving us enormous amounts of power compared to doing it through classical computing. But, you know, Bitcoin, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't go in that direction. <laughs> I, I wouldn't make a strong statement in that. Thanks both for those answers. Um, so we've got a couple people who are tuning in who are interested in going into the field of quantum computing and wanted to know, you know, what, what kind of background would they need? You know, could they go into the field after graduating with just a bachelor's degree? Do you need to pursue a master's or a doctorate? Um, Sarah and, and Kasra, what were your backgrounds? How did you get involved in this field? Um, I can start. So I, all my degrees are in electrical engineering and computer science. I kind of took a circuitous path. I started in biology and then moved to computer science and electrical engineering. Then I took a quantum class and I liked that. And that's where my quantum journey started. Um, and I think, so one, we're starting to enter the time where you can, you know, work at these companies with a bachelor's degree, um, you know, like any other industry, the more schooling you have, the more complex, or you know, you can work on more complex problems right after school. Um, but that's not to say you can also learn that on the job. Um, and you, there are so many different, you know, quantum science in general is very interdisciplinary. So you know, I come from electrical engineering degree. I will say even in my physics lab now, the large majority of my day is solving electrical engineering problems. Um, you know, if you're interested in chemistry, there's a lot of quantum chemistry that we've alluded to many times today. Um, physics, obviously, um, math, computer science, and there are many different paths to get involved. Yeah, um, from, from my side, you know, my really primary passion was physics, uh, but I was really interested on both end, in, in both ends of it, both the, the hands-on lab work and uh, the abstract and the mathematical side of it. So in my undergrad, I ended up studying all three. I, I officially, my major was electrical engineering and computer science at Berkeley, but I minored in math and physics and did all of the, the coursework. Um, but uh, you don't really need to do that, you know, that, that kind of broad background. And in, in my PhD, I, I did applied physics, really doing, again, a combination of all of those. Uh, the, the, that's the label applied physics is just a label, but yeah, I uh, ended up doing uh, electrical engineering and uh, all the other stuff. Um, but it doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, what I, you know, I, and I tried to kind of allude to this in, in my talk, is that this is really is a multidisciplinary effort. Uh, the work that we do at the Advanced Quantum Testbed uh, and the Quantum Systems Accelerator, which is another newer uh, kind of a center at, at Berkeley Lab, uh, is truly multidisciplinary. We have people from with backgrounds in physics, chemistry, material science, uh, mathematics, computer science, uh, and more, everybody working together. Uh, so while I would say that at least having some college level physics is probably a must, you don't need to become a physicist, you don't need to do a degree in physics to become involved in this. Uh, you should really do uh, pursue what you like and what really interests you, and uh, there will be a place for you in this field, and it really needs, this field really needs the, the efforts of everybody working together. Um, and uh, again, what Sarah said, uh, the field is opening up now. It used to be uh, you, need to, you needed to have a PhD to be in the field. And nowadays, uh, with a bachelor's or master's, you can get involved on, on working on particular components uh, of the problems we face every day in the lab. 
Got it. Thanks, Sarah and Kassar, for that answer. Um, and Kassar, I think you can probably stop sharing your screen now. Yes. Um, but uh, let me go to this question. Um, you know, given the advancements in research that's being put into the uh, you know sort of quantum algorithm side of side of things, how big is the gap between algorithm advancements and the quantum hardware that's needed? I can take that. It's huge. Um, so for uh, for instance, for factoring. Uh, numbers, as Kasser mentioned earlier, um, we need a fully, what they call fault tolerant universal quantum computer. So a quantum computer that acts like a classical computer and that it you don't have to worry about errors and it can do nearly everything you want it to. Um, and to get that fault tolerance and to get to the size where you can um, factor numbers that will be, you know, that are used now to encrypt uh, channels, you need on the order of like a million qubits and a billion gates. And we are now at the order of, you know, 50 qubits is kind of state of the art. That was that Google demonstration uh, last year, May 2019, I forget. Um, and, you know, hundreds of gates, let's say. Um, and so we are orders of magnitude off. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges facing computer science, quantum computing. Um, today. And then also for simulating molecules, the same kind of orders of magnitude hold. Um, so we, we're missing orders of magnitude. But that's what makes it exciting. Yeah, I mean, but but that's true of, I, I, I would like to add that that's really true of most other things, most other fields of science as well. Theory is always ahead of uh, experiment and application, right? And, uh, but, but we're working closely, theorists and uh, experimentalists, everybody's working closely together and one informs the other always. Thank you both for those answers. So um, thinking about the things we're gonna think about, right? Which is what Sarah had, we're gonna think about coherency and error and these sorts of the three pillars um, <laughs> of quantum computing. We, I'm gonna give you two questions. Um, one, what is the, um, what main challenges do you face when trying to reduce errors? And I guess, where do these errors even come from in the first place? So where are the errors coming from? Um, and then given coherence time limitations, does that mean that quantum computing is only for processing and not for storage? So that was related to the last question a bit too. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, maybe if you wanna start. Yeah, so the answers will be probably slightly different for the both of us. So in trapped ion qubits, most of the errors actually come from the control fields themselves. So we're, fair, we're fairly good at isolating trapped ions, um, but then we need to control them. And it's those control mechanisms that give us errors. So um, noise on our lasers, for instance, or noisy magnetic fields, because we use magnetic fields to kind of define our qubit levels. And so if those become noisy, then our qubit becomes noisy. Um, so those are kind of the two main um, fidelity and coherence time limitations. Um, there are also, we see some noise from surfaces. There are obviously other caveats. And once you remove one source of noise, then another source of noise becomes dominant. So it's kind of a, a never ending struggle. Um, and then there was a question about um, quantum memories. And um, I would say that that is, I, I think in general, that's true. We're never going to kind of get a solid state. When you think of your solid state hard drive where, you know, you can take one that's been sitting on your table for the last 20 years, and if you could hook it up to your computer, you could read it out again. That probably you won't see that in a quantum realm anytime soon, um, although never say never. But I will also point out an important point is that even if there's this decoherence, it has been shown that you can uh, correct for errors and get an overall, um, you know, a logical qubit or a logical system that uh, has errors that are less than the er errors of your individual physical qubits. So we can get, we kind of can extend past that coherence time. We don't need to do all of our computation within that coherence time. We can play some tricks. Oh, interesting. And so would those corrections change through time then? Yeah, so it's kind of like if you know classical error correction, you can, um, you know, if you wanted to send a state zero across a noisy channel, instead you could send a bunch of zeros 
Um, so you encode your small state into a larger system. And the same thing you can do with a very similar thing in quantum uh, computing. Well, interesting. So Kassler, do you wanna answer those two questions from um, your specific field? Sure, yeah. Uh, it is, I mean, that's really the, you know, part of the bane of our existence uh, is, is all of those different sources of errors. And there's a whole lot of them and uh, not all of them are really all that well understood. Uh, actually, this is an active, active area of research on its own, both characterizing these errors and mitigating them. There, there's a whole field called uh, quantum characterization, verification and validation. QCVV, um, and uh, there are both companies uh, that, that do this, for example, Quantum Benchmark, uh, that's, that's basically the, the product that they develop and, and uh, 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 offer, and uh, we work with them, uh, partly they, they work closely with you know, researchers in the field, and there's, uh, I would also like to give a shout out to the, the Quantum Performance Lab at the Sandia National Lab, so who also works on this. Um, it's really an active area of research to, to find different ways of characterizing the, the errors that come up and uh, mitigating them both through algorithmic uh, solutions and also uh, hardware engineering. Um, and to, to give an example of, of, of some of these errors, there's uh, something called crosstalk, which means that you want to address uh, one qubit, but then you end up addressing other qubits at the same time uh, unintentionally. Um, then there, there are couplings between qubits that are always there and you don't, you don't want them to be there and, and that needs to be engineered out. Uh, there are you know, sources of thermal noise and that's what the dilution fridge is partly engineered uh, uh, to, to address. Uh, all different sources of, 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 uh, of errors. And uh, to draw an analogy again with classical computing, uh, you know, when I did my uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering and computer science uh, a few years ago, I never had to take a course on, on errors and error correction in classical computing. And if I had done that uh, same program 10 or 20 years earlier, you know, I, I think even up until the 90s, anybody graduating with uh, a degree that had computer science in it somewhere uh, would have to take a course on error correction so that they, you would need to know how to handle errors that, that arise. And we don't think about that anymore. It took several decades, but uh, we basically think of classical computing as error free these days. Uh, we don't, we, you graduate with a degree in computer science and you never learn how to, how to handle those, right? That's, the, that's where we are now. And uh, in, in quantum computing, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the errors are, you know? So, um, yeah. <laughs> and then, oh, uh, uh, quantum memory. Uh, yeah, that's kind of like uh, nowadays it's still in, in, in the realm of unicorns uh, uh, for us. Uh, it's, uh, it is, uh, yeah, as Sarah said, I, I, uh, ditto. It's, uh, we're not going to get to that, that state of quantum memory where, where, you, where you have a solid state drive or you have something and you store your quantum information there and stays there for, uh, for months or years or even minutes. Uh, or seconds, we're not anywhere close. People are working on different schemes uh, so that if you have longer coherence times, we can do something about that for very short uh, periods of time. But no, we don't really have quantum memory nowadays. Um, but uh, again, as Sarah said, the, we don't uh, need to do all of our quantum computation in one go. Uh, so there's, for example, uh, the, the example of the hydrogen molecule uh, that I showed, that was done through something called uh, um, uh, the the uh, quantum uh, variational eigen solver, uh, and uh, it's it's basically a combination of uh, uh, a quantum computer and a classical computer working hand in hand. You do part of your computation in the classical in the quantum computer. Uh, you read out the the results of that. Do some processing in your classical computer, and then you feed that back that information back into your quantum computer to do the next step of quantum uh, computation. And so uh, the two really work hand in hand together. So just because uh, the the coherence times are short, it doesn't mean that that is all of the time you have. There are all sorts of smart schemes you can come up with to, uh, to get around that to some degree. Yeah. Got it, thanks both. Um, so one question for you about 
applications, um, and in particular applications for artificial intelligence. You know, each of the neurons in our own sort of human brains are unique, but current robots, you know, all use the same, let's call them neurons. Um, will quantum computing be able to create better AI? This is a huge area of research at the moment. Um, and as far as I know, there have been no proven speed ups, but there is a lot of hope that we could get there. Yeah, and, uh, I don't think I can add much more. It's really just, uh, it is a, an area of huge interest. Everybody is really looking into that and, and it is very early on to say anything. Got it. Uh, so another, I'm gonna go to another technical question. Uh, what does it mean to simulate a quantum system, say molecular bonding with a quantum computer? Uh, would one run the same ab initio algorithms on the quantum computer or is it fundamentally different? It would be, I don't know much about quantum chemistry, you know, as, or the field of classical quantum chemistry, um, but I think it is fairly different. So the idea here is that the dynamics of a quantum system or a molecule as a quantum system are governed by what we call unitary matrices. And these are the same things that govern a artificial quantum system. And so we can, there, again, this is a huge field of uh, theoretical research, but we can, you know, uh, encode the same dynamics and, um, you know, energy uh, propagation through time uh, on a quantum computer. So it's, you, take your system, you think of some tricks to encode it in the, you know, the simplest way possible on your engineered quantum system and then run time forward and see what happens. Got it. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so a couple more questions. People are very interested in the dilution refrigerator. <laughs> um, one question is, are those off the shelf parts or are you having to create bespoke systems every time you create a, a quantum system? And uh, sort of a tangential question, I guess, is um, have you been having any issues with accessing um, helium availability for, the, for, the, for that cryogenic work? Yeah, good questions. Uh, so the first part, it used to be up until you know, 10, 20 years ago that, that a lot of people were building their own uh, dilution fridges. And we actually, uh, in our own lab at, at, at UC Berkeley, uh, where we started before the advanced quantum test, but uh, we had one or two of these systems that we built. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's gotten to the point now where the technology is, has become kind of mature. Um, and you can really buy uh, the, the dilution fridge to some degree wired up uh, just commercially and, and they work really well. Uh, still, there are parts that you need to build yourself. You know, there are particular amplifiers, for example, that um, uh, you know, amplify, you know, single photons essentially coming out and you can't really buy those commercially yet. And we fabricate them in our lab. That was something that we developed. Uh, and uh, so, uh, there are parts of the system, definitely, uh, the most cutting edge parts, you have to build your own, and we do that. And that's part of, part of what, uh, the engineering side of things that go into it. Uh, and then for the second part of the uh, question, helium availability. Um, so that's, that's a very specific, interesting question. Uh, 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 so I mentioned we take advantage of, so you, there are different isotopes of helium, right? Helium-4, just using a compressor, you can get down to 4 Kelvin. To get down to 10 millikelvin, to get below that 4 Kelvin level, you need uh, to take advantage of the phase dynamics uh, between helium-3 and helium-4. And helium-3 isotope, that is the, 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 the trickier part to produce. Uh, and I won't get into how it is produced and, and, and whatnot, but yeah, that is suffering some shortages at the moment. Uh, we haven't had any big issues. There are, uh, there is a good supply still uh, for, for research. Uh, but yeah, it would always be good to have more, I guess. Excellent. So we are going to ask two more questions because I want to make sure to get to as many as the ones that have rolled in from the audience. So um, the first one is. Uh, what is the main interaction with the environment that actually causes decoherence, entanglement, um, photons, gravity, those sorts of things? Yeah, so it's different for, I, I think there are some similarities with the, the different platforms, but there are some differences as well. I guess I will answer it for, from my side and then Sarah can uh, chime in from, from her side. Uh, it's a number of different things. It's, you know, you can think of, uh, 
in order to communicate with the uh, with the quantum processor, you have to wire it up. You have to connect like a coaxial RF cable to it. And that provides a pathway for thermal energy to get in, right? You have, you have essentially, you have a wire running from your room temperature all the way down to zero Kelvin. Uh, and that pathway is, is you know, provides uh, thermal conduction. And uh, thermal noise, the phonons, you know, just thermal noise is essentially atoms is jiggling, right? And uh, if that vibrates all the way to your quantum processor and couples to it, that, that is a source of decoherence, right? So you have to do some cryogenic uh, engineering to try to isolate that out as much as possible. Uh, but then there are other sources, like there's magnetic noise. So we have magnetic shielding, for example, uh, the, the Josephson junctions and, and the loops of them that, that uh, I, I mentioned briefly, uh, that build up the transmon, uh, those are very sensitive. They, they, they actually can be used as, uh, you know, aside from computation, they can be used as magnetic sensors, uh, something called a SQUID, the superconducting uh, quantum interference device. And uh, the fact that they can be used as really highly sensitive uh, magnetic sensors means that if you use them for computation, the magnetic noise is, is interfering with the computation itself. So you have to know, shield against that. Um, and uh, then you have, you know, uh, photons as well. You have black body radiation inside, even if it is at, at four Kelvin or a Kelvin or whatnot, uh, you still have unwanted uh, photons that are shining on your sample. So you have to shield against all of these. And these are some, some mechanisms. Thanks. Sarah, how about you? Environmental um, yeah. issues you have to deal with. <laughs> Yeah, I want to say first that because I read up like a really important point where if you look at the field of quantum information processing, often a new, you'll see these papers published that are like, we could maybe do quantum information processing, and then, okay, well, maybe not, let's do quantum sensing instead, because, you know, you sense the things that make it impossible for you to do quantum information processing. There's always like a, a good side of the coin and a bad side of the coin. So trapped ions, for instance, are incredibly good at sensing magnetic fields also means that they uh, that's a big source of decoherence. Um, also, as I mentioned before, laser noise. So, you know, we don't use coax cables to connect physically with our qubits, but, you know, these control fields that we're bringing in our laser fields, so any noise on those causes the decoherence. And then finally, there's electric field noise. So we do need to trap uh, these uh, ions with, you know, DC fields, electric fields, and these need to come from uh, electrodes and the, you know, the physical makeup of those electrodes could have, you know, noisy surfaces, atoms moving around when you shoot lasers on them, and that creates electric field noise, which creates motional heating in our ions and can uh, mess up our quantum state. Um, those are kind of the main things. Great, thank you. Okay, last question. Are there technologies to connect different quantum processing units in a quantum way is this an important is this uh, is this an import for scaling up as networks are are for classical computers i hope that made sense <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah that's a very natural question yeah uh, so that's the whole idea of quantum networking and and the quantum internet that is definitely on the radar uh, for a lot of people there there have been a lot of very interesting uh, papers coming out um, and uh, so the answer, the, the short answer is um, yes, there will be. Uh, so it, it is an active area of research. It, it, it doesn't really uh, exist in a, in a good way uh, now, I would say. Uh, but, uh, and there are, you know, it's for, it really depends on the quantum platform that you have. Uh, some, some platforms are more amenable to existing technologies for quantum networking. And uh, some, some platforms are not. So there are steps you need to take in order to basically you, you generate a photon uh, at the output of your uh, quantum processor. You need to entangle that somehow to, to something that gets transported uh, across a network uh, without interacting with the environment, right? So the good thing is, for example, if you're, trans if, if you're, uh, if you're transporting a photon, a photon does not experience time, right? So uh, that's the good thing about it, but but it can still interfere, you know, with the environment in some other way. So, um, and uh, this will, it, you know, a lot of people believe that this will be a lot of uh, uh, one of the mechanisms for scaling up for um, tying together uh, multiple quantum uh, computers. Uh, 
to to augment uh, the, the power overall. And uh, who knows? Yeah, maybe maybe one day we will have a quantum internet uh, where you can connect quantum computers from different institutions and places from around the world. Uh, but uh, it's a very interesting challenge, and uh, a lot of people are working on it. I will just add to that, that for superconducting qubits, it's particularly hard to network, but for atomic light systems, it comes quite naturally to network them together with optical fields because um, we can read out their states into, um, you know, a, a quantum optical uh, field. Um, and then those can be fairly easily uh, transmitted. So there have been, you know, small quantum networks demonstrated, um, you know, in Delft and Boston, um, in other places in China. Um, so yeah, it, it is possible and it's a huge area of research. I'm just gonna say that before we wrap up, Jen, um, that people have been asking for resources and maybe some of you talked about different books. So maybe um, after this, we can collect those from you. And when we send our thank you emails to the people who have been on this, um, who joined us today, we can, we can add some of those resources. Does that sound good? Yeah, okay. Wonderful. I, I can't believe how quickly the time went by this afternoon. So fast. We are, I know we're at the end of our event. And uh, before we close, I want to thank Casper and Sarah one more time for the presentations. Um, I want to thank the audience for tuning in and asking really fantastic questions. If you want to stay up to date on research coming out of our institutions, you can visit science at Cal berkeley.edu or lbl.gov. Uh, don't forget to tune in to next month's presentation. We're going to be talking about the energy water nexus. Uh, and I'll just say thanks again. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Incredibly fabulous. Thank you guys. Thank thanks you. everyone. Bye.